Hey guys, my name is Nick and welcome back to the channel and in today's Warhammer community update we've got a faction focus on my other true love, the Thousand Sons. If you've been around this channel for some time, I'm sure you're aware that I do have a rather substantial Thousand Sons army uh, rocking in at around about 4,000 points uh, that was completed as one of my projects for 2020. So obviously I've got to cover the Thousand Sons faction focus because there's some big news around the Supreme Command Detachment and that's what I'm going to take a look at in today's video so let's get straight into it. So the big news of the day is the Supreme Command Detachment. I've got that on screen for you now. The key point here, the command cost is zero command points. We've already seen a bunch of other detachments that cost X number of CP and then some of those are refunded depending on how your Warlord fits into that detachment. The Supreme Command Detachment comes with a number of limitations and changes from 8th edition. 8th edition you quite often found a Supreme Command Detachment did actually involve the Thousand Sons quite a lot. It would be Araman and a couple of Demon Princes for example. You ran basically a number of HQs, I think it was a minimum of 3, maximum of 5 HQ choices within your Supreme Command and that gave you an extra CP in 8th edition and it was a good bolt on to a lot of forces for that psychic dominance. 9th edition, big changes though, you can only include one Supreme Command detachment in your army. The detachment can only include a Primarch, a Demon Primarch or this new keyword of a Supreme Commander, we don't know much about that yet and that unit must be your Warlord. So. Uh, and then we get those command benefits. Select one of the following. You get plus four command points if your army includes a brigade, three for a battalion, two for any other um, things like patrols. So the key here is that you take a warlord who is a Primarch, basically the big daddy of any of these uh, factions that have them, so Rebute, Gilliman, and Key here being Magnus the Red, but equally uh, Mortarian as well. You make them your Warlord, and then your next detachment, which contains all of your other uh, models, such as a uh, battalion, is now going to be free as well. So you're going to keep that maximum 12 CP that everybody's getting uh, from the get-go before you start spending it on additional uh, pieces, like putting stuff into uh, uh, reserves and so on. So for me, this actually fits very narratively as well. Quite often you would see uh, a a big named character in an army in 8th edition who wouldn't be the Warlord. You'd pick someone like a, a Primaris Lieutenant or some lesser character just so that you can get their buffs away from your Warlord and maximise opportunity. Now this is forcing us to say, you know what, if you've got a Primarch, he's going to be your Warlord because he's the boss of your faction. Why would you then say an exalted sorcerer is going to be your Warlord despite having Araman or... Magnus in your force. That just doesn't fit thematically in my head. And now Games Workshop are kind of saying, do you know what, if you want to play these kind of big daddy uh, characters, they're going to be your boss and you're going to get some benefit for it. So now we've covered the changes to the Supreme Command Detachment. There were other, another couple of pieces in this uh, faction focus around psychic actions. So previous editions, we just had a psychic phase where a traditional Thousand Suns player will attempt to smite the hell out of their opponent, and that would be it. And there'd be some other buffs and and you know uh, prescience and warp time and all those all those good things. But we now know there's some additional actions that can be completed in the psychic phase. So a psyker from your unit can attempt to perform a psychic action in its psychic phase instead of attempting to manifest a psychic power. And you can't do that if you are if you've fallen back this turn. A psyker can only attempt to perform one psychic action per battle round. So every psyker unit can do it, uh, but each psyker unit can only do it the once. To perform a psychic action with a psyker unit, you must first pass a regular psychic test, which we've uh, all know and love through uh, the previous edition. And you can still perils on this on a double one or a double six. The opposing uh, player can still attempt to deny, which is uh, uh, pretty standard. Now we might not know what all of them are going to be, but we do know there are going to be three secondary objectives to choose from in match play. 
which will be part of the psychic actions as part of your secondary capability of scoring victory points within a game. The one they've given us the example from today, though, is Mental Interrogation. Score three victory points each time you successfully complete the following psychic action. Mental Interrogation. It's a psychic action warp charge of four, whereas we're normally using a regular warp charge for a psychic test uh, to cast a power. One psychic character from your army can attempt to perform the psychic action in your psychic phase if it is within 18 inches of any enemy character models. Basically what you're doing then is psychically ripping information from those commanders from your opponent and that's going to be worth three victory points each time you successfully complete that. Now there is a maximum I believe on secondary objective scoring so once you've achieved that maximum I think it was 15 points so I think you can do this five times uh, to, uh, to get the maximum out here. Uh, but it does give us a clue about what psychic actions are going to be capable of doing and how they're going to be uh, scoring. It does sound like 9th edition is going to be very victory point heavy. There's going to be lots of ways to score points, which is a really, really cool thing. It will be interesting to know, though, whether we're going to get a plus 6 inches to the range of this for being a Brotherhood of Psychers army. Uh, with a lot of our psychic powers, we get that plus 6 inches if we are battle forged. Um, and this rule, or this mental interrogation, I believe is going to be a generic thing for all psychers, but they've just brought it up because uh, the uh, faction focus on the Thousand Suns, which is a very psyker heavy force. So what does this all mean for us Thousand Suns players then? Um, as you may have known, I've played Thousand Suns pretty much throughout 8th edition. That was kind of the uh, the mainstay for me. I, I kind of started them at the start, finished them at the end, uh, and I'm ready to rock them into the new edition. But am I going to include Magnus in my army? I guess the answer is going to come to whether how many points he's gone up by and how many points everything else goes up by within the army. Now, that is probably the biggest challenge. Now, is Magnus going to be viable in an army? I think yes. Uh, mainly because the, the big problem with him before was that he got shot off the board in turn one before he got to do most of his good stuff. Yes, he can still be quick. Yes, you can warp time him. Yes, you can get him up there. And then he chews up you know, quite a lot of points in your force. And if he doesn't get that return on investment, he was, he was pretty toast. The new uh, terrain rules means that he cannot be obscured behind terrain because he is 18 or over wounds. So you can't hide him behind a building. But what you can do is invest command points and put him into strategic reserve. That means he's not going to be around for a couple of turns... But he then can come on from the side of the board, or from your own board edge, you know, whichever. But that does mean that things then change. You know that you can prevent an alpha strike, you can prevent the the wiping of your big warlord in turn one. You can bring him in a little bit later in the game where it might turn the tide. Now that is going to cost you some investment, but at least we know that if you include him, he's for free. And then we can take a battalion or any other detachments, have the points refunded on that, so we're going to be at 12 minus, uh, I believe it's 2 points for book Magnus into Strategic Reserve. You're still running 10. The game length is now fixed at 5, so we're going to regen 5 CP throughout the game. We can probably still get CPs back through uh, various artefacts. So, yeah, it's, it's probably not a bad idea to still keep him in a force. I think he's still now very, very viable. But again, if his price goes up by stupid amounts, then maybe not. Uh, only time will tell, and that time is very, very soon. So just to finish out this video, it's not the main theme of the video because I'm not a specific news channel. Uh, I am focusing on the factions I've got. Uh, but in case you haven't heard, Indomitus is out on the 11th for pre-order and will be released on the 25th of July. Uh, so we can find out all that final information, put it together, spend the weekend digesting all the new rules, building our army lists, and cracking on. And hopefully... Um, we might even be able to get some games. Who knows? Uh, subject to crazy lockdowns, it might be another couple of months before we even start playing uh, 40k, certainly in the UK at least anyway. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, I'd love to know in the comments section what you think. Are you going to be looking at Magnus in your forces? Uh, and obviously this does apply to Rabute Gilliman and to uh, uh, Mortarian as well. But uh, yeah, for me, I think that puts Magnus potentially back on the menu, regardless of the new terrain rules, because uh, they'll still benefit all of your other troops. 
but it does stop him dying in turn one, and that is a big key for me. So I'd love to hear from you in the comment section below, but I hope you enjoyed this quick video. If you did, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And I shall catch you guys on the next video.